Well, good morning. I know it's two elf clips in a row. I, I had a clip from Wonderful Life, but it was kind of sad. And then I saw that clip and I said, oh, that's just... Because here's the thing. Everybody who's... How many of you have seen that movie? How many of you have only seen that part of the movie? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. What's funny is last night somebody sitting back there literally mouthed the words at the exact time he was saying them. And I'm like, you've watched it a few too many times. But uh, the truth is this, you know, motives are an interesting thing. You know, in that, in that uh, uh, clip, we know that he had good motives. He had good intentions. But here's the truth about life, and here's what I want you to know. Today we're going to talk about part of the Christmas story. Okay, don't tell anybody what I'm about to tell you. This is part of the Christmas story that happened after the Christmas story. And yet, if you come to my house... I've got a manger scene with wise men, which is theologically incorrect, and I'm the pastor of the church, but my mom made it, and it will be out no matter what. So there you go. So, all right. So, oh, a couple things today. I wrote them on my Palm Pilot. Um, Rodney, great job with the Lord's Supper. You know, it's one of the hardest things to do is to lead the Lord's Supper, and you did such a great job, and always do, my friend. And I, I appreciate you. And uh, he's very rarely nervous, but he was actually nervous this morning, which, you know, he's a submariner. Those guys are crazy. And yet, the Lord's Supper. So thank you for all you do. We appreciate it every week. So um, he does drive the coolest car in the church, although he said that my wife's car is a close second. So he's telling me this morning. Uh, today is my daughter, Jenna, who is here this morning from Seattle. Today is her gotcha day 16 years ago. Now, if you don't know what a gotcha day is, that's okay. You don't have to be smart. But it means when you adopt a child, when you actually get the paperwork and everything goes through. So 16 years ago today, I had a fanny pack on. Now, here's why. Because I was in Taiwan and I had to carry all this stuff on public transportation to find this office that had a thick glass window with guards out front to exchange paperwork and Jenna became officially my daughter. And so, Jenna, we're so glad. And most days, she's pretty glad that we, she's adopted. And then some days, she's like, mm, not so sure today. Last but not least, at the end of the service, we're going to do something we have not done, ready for this, in three years. We're actually going to pass an offering basket and, but just so you know, for those of you who aren't used to that, you don't have to put anything in it. So don't be like, I can't believe we had that basket go by us. Because just don't give if you're going to be grumpy about it. That's, you know, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So if you're not cheerful, <laughs> well, it's up to you. I can't tell you what God thinks about a grumpy giver. It doesn't say... <laughs> Okay, was that my three announcements? Did I get them out? Is there any other announcements that I didn't write on my hand? No? There's a sign. Oh, there's signs out back. Take one with you. Oh, and the blood drive today. And, and if you're a guest, if you didn't hear the announcement about guests, you tear off the bullet and you actually put that in the offering basket later. And I love, by the way, on Tuesdays I pray for the prayer requests that you turn in. So um, I love that. And so don't feel like you're bothering anybody by writing your prayer request. You may, you may even think that your prayer request is silly, but there's nothing silly to God. So you write it down. I love to pray for you guys and really do. Um, so there's that. All right. So have you ever had somebody, you ready for this? So Buddy was hurtful on accident, but have you ever had somebody who was hurtful to you on purpose and did something to you? You know, over the years, I've, I've got lots of stories. I'm going to tell you at least one of them. But I got lots of stories about people. When you're a pastor, there are people who get close to you in order to manipulate other people. And it's one of the things that you have to learn if you're a pastor. And that's one of the things I tell young pastors is be careful who you let close to you. Because there's people who will be really nice and act like the nicest person. And their whole goal of getting close to you is either to sell things to other people literally or figuratively to sell things to other people to pretend they have power or control or something else. And it's really a sad thing. But the truth is, we've all had people in our lives. But I would love to tell you that I was never one of those people. But at least once in my life, I was. Because when I was about three years old, by the way, I don't remember this story. But my sister Kelly, who is perfect, remembers this story. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, when they would get mad at me, would take my stuffed animal and rip the legs, and obviously the ears disappeared, and the eyes and the arms off of poor Doggy. That's my original name for this dog. And uh, so, but one day, for whatever reason, I got mad at my sister, and I went to my mom, and I said, Kelly pulled my dog's ears, and my sister got spanked and didn't do anything. And I have blocked this out apparently in my three-year-old memory because it's only 50 years ago, but trust me, she remembers. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Most of the time, if we're honest, we don't purposefully try to hurt somebody. We might hurt somebody, but typically our motives were good, our intentions were good. But there are people in the world, and you've dealt with them, who intentionally hurt others. And here's what I want you to know about the wise men visiting. God already knows what you're going to deal with. I'm not saying God caused that to happen, but God knew that was going to happen. And because the Bible says he works all things out for the good, it means that even the people who try to manipulate you, even the people who try to hurt you, even the people who try to attack you, if, if, if you deal with it the right way, if you deal with it God's way, then he will even use those people. And in this story, God even used an evil king, an evil ruler, Herod, to get Jesus exactly where he wanted him. But he even used secular wise men, whether they were astronomers or astrologers or just something in between. He even used these guys who did not worship God the way the Jews did. He even used them to accomplish his purpose. So I want you to look today at these three things, and I want you to think about the things that have happened in your life. Maybe some of them you're still bitter about. And maybe it's time to Elsa it and let it go. Let it go. Don't, I don't remember the next line. Hold it back anymore. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about truths about motives. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 2 as our main thing. And Randy Spolstra just texted me from 20 degree Iowa, which he said is overrated. And he said, Eric, you look good in high def. And I just want to say thanks. By the way, Garrett, he also said he loved your shirt in high def. So, so here's number one. By the way, Steve is also watching. Steve has been sick now for six weeks. So you can pray for Steve, our, our associate pastor here, and go out of your way to encourage him. He's got a virus, so the doctor can't do anything to make him better. Um, but I've thought of some things. Um, waterboarding, a um, few other things in my life. All right, number one, we can't know the motives of others. Now, I'm going to talk about this more in a second, but let me read this. Matthew 2, 1 through 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, when I kind of gave you a definition of that a second ago, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked. By the way, time out. I got to tell you this. The Magi, we know that they were from the Babylon area. And years before this, there was a wise dude uh, who had been visited by Gabriel, by the way. And he actually taught the Magi about the Messiah to come. His name was Daniel. Don't know if you heard about him, but some of the th ideas that maybe this was people who were followers and had come after Daniel as one of the wise men. You remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that whole story. All right. Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? Remember that. I'm going to come back to that and talk about how, uh, Howard. I'm going to talk about Howard. King Howard. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Howard was in church last night. I always call Howard any name with an H. So now I'm doing it to Bible characters, apparently. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. By the way, people always uh, keep going. All right. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Let me tell you why he was, or why Jerusalem was disturbed and why he was disturbed. He was paranoid. He killed family members that he thought might take his throne. His own family members. To the point that Caesar Augustus, who we're going to hear about when we go back to the cross. By the way, the, the manger always points to the cross. And the cross is always on the wall, if you haven't noticed. And, and so uh, uh, 
he actually said about, uh, Caesar Augustus actually said about Harvey, he said, um, <laughs> King Harvey, is that his name? So he actually said about Harold, uh, he, said, uh, he said, better to be a pig in his house than to be a family member. And so when you go back to this story and you understand when they said, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? You look here at Herod and Herod is listening to this. And here's the deal. Do you know what the other Romans called Harvey? Do you know what they called Harold? Oh, do you know what they called Herod? They called him king of the Jews. Did you know that? Because he was the one who ruled over the Jews, so they called him king of the Jews. So I'm sure when the wise men came up and said, where's king of the Jews, that he went right here. And then they said, we followed his star when it rose, when he was born. And they're like, he's like, oh, that's not me. And so what happened? He was disturbed. By the way, he was disturbed before he was disturbed. Right? Don't you know people like that? Like, they're, they're getting a head start on being disturbed, Right? So he did that, and then what happened? Jerusalem got disturbed because, they, because every time stuff like this happened, not good things happened. He had wiped out Jews in the past. He's actually the one who helped build the, rebuild the temple, and then, but he put a Roman uh, uh, eagle uh, over the doorway, which, by the way, was prophesied in the Old Testament. So here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever had somebody who pretended they had pure motives that didn't. When I student taught, there was another student that student taught uh, uh, near my classroom, and I was student teaching, and my uh, uh, professor from the college lined up an interview for me, and I went to the interview and came back, and that student came to me and said, hey, how'd your interview go? I said, great. She said, where did you go? I said, oh, I went to this school and had an interview, and come to find out, she went and called the school and got an interview and got the job instead of me at that school, and come to find out from the other teachers that she actually brag to them how she had manipulated me in order to get that information. But can I tell you the truth? I wouldn't be here today if I had taken that teaching position in West Palm Beach. Here's the thing. So many times we look back and we think, what a doofus about somebody in our life. And yet God can use that very person. When I read this story, I think, well, they were supposed to be wise men. Did they not think it would be a problem to tell this guy, king of the Jews? I mean, they had to have heard some of the rumors, right? Were they this dense? Here's what I know about life. Because a lot of times we kick ourselves. How did I not notice that? They seemed okay to me. I mean, I never thought they would sell a billion dollars in cryptocurrency. That's this week's headline, if you didn't know. Such a shocker, right? And so, and so here we are going through life, and have you ever had somebody do something to you, and you look back and you still grit your teeth when you think about what they did? But God can even use that person in your life. And they may even call right now to check on you. Proverbs 16, 2 says this, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. By the way, we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions. And we judge others by our perceptions, right? But we judge ourselves by our intent. I meant to do well. I meant to work out today. I meant to whatever, right? But we judge others, right? By how we perceive what they did. Oh, they're probably just doing that for whatever. It's hard to know sometimes what other people's intentions are. But the truth is, if we're not careful, we will, in life, become more like Herod than like the wise men. Everybody wants to think they're the wise men who are just giving their gifts away. But too often we're like the wise men until we get close to people and then we're like, nah, their picture looks better than mine. I'm not sharing crayons with them, right? So here's what I want you to do instead. Ask God to examine your motives. Instead of worrying so much about what other people's motives are, and listen, I want you to be discerning, and some of you are very discerning. You're going to be right 99 out of 100 times. But guess what? There's going to be one you miss. And so don't worry so much about that and look at your own heart and say, God, would you evaluate my heart? Lord, did I really pull the dog's ears? God, did I really do that with the right attitude, with the right heart or no? I love this quote by David Jeremiah. In God's sight, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas whenever we rediscover 
the simplicity of his love and bow down in thankfulness and worship where we are and whatever our circumstances. Number two, ugly motives come from selfishness. Now, how many of you have ever tried to help someone unselfishly? Right? How many of you ever tried to help someone unselfishly and were punished for it? Yeah, okay, right? Right? No good deed goes unpunished. If you haven't done that yet, I'll never forget. I jump-started somebody's car, and then they closed my hood for me. Well, they forgot to remove the stick, so they destroyed my hood of my car. <laughs> Thanks so much. Right? And so those things happen. I remember years ago, a seminary professor talking about his neighbor going out of town for three weeks. And after about a week and a half, he's lived in New Orleans, and so the grass was like, you know, New Orleans high. And, and so he went and mowed the neighbor's grass and said, I'm mowing the grass for Jesus. I'm mowing the grass for Jesus. And he went and mowed the grass. And his neighbor came home a week and a half later. And guess what? The grass was right back where it was. And so the neighbor went out, cut his grass. And the seminary professor said he went a week, didn't say anything. And he thought, he didn't know I mowed his grass. And after about two weeks, he finally went over and said, by the way, I mowed your grass when you were gone. And he said he was praying the next morning, and the Lord said, I thought you were doing that for me. Right? That's us. Too often we think, well, I'm doing it with the right motivation, but when things don't go well is when you figure out if you're doing it right. By the way, if you help with anything at our church or do anything, you try to do it for Jesus, your motives are going to be tested. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people have helped early in the morning with something and they come in, whether it's to help in the kitchen or they're helping set up or they're picking up paper, and then the person who called them and asked them to help doesn't show up. And they think, well, I'm the only one that works around here. I'm the only one that helps at the church. If these other people would only do their part, right? And, and suddenly it becomes about, well, look how good I am. Wait a second, I thought we were doing this for Jesus. Maybe instead we were doing it for Jesus. Matthew 2, 4 through 8. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And here's what they said. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And you can almost hear the sarcasm in this one. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him with soldiers and swords. I mean, right? Right? I mean, this is a guy who killed family members. He wasn't too worried about a Jewish baby. He was going to take care of this problem ahead of time. And so even though he told them what they, they wanted to hear, he was looking out for himself. Listen, one of the ways you can always judge what you're doing is look at what your motives are. Are they selfish and self-centered? Do you continually say I and me and my and this? And, or do you look for God? What do you want me to do? You ever have somebody hurt you, and then you want them to fail? Now, let me give you a dumb illustration. How many of you like sports? Anybody in here like sports? Brian, you have a team you like. What's that team you like? Uh, they got a little paw or something. Clemson, right? Okay. So I'll never forget years ago, Ricky and I would, had uh, season tickets to the Orlando Magic when Shaquille O'Neal played. And we just loved, I mean, they would introduce Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal. So exciting. And Ricky was this little cute little kid with a, this cool stuff hat and screaming and all of a sudden Shaq said I'm going to LA and all of a sudden we hated Shaq <laughs> how dare he leave our team and go and play do any of you have experience like see if you don't do sports you're like that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard <laughs> so buckle up buttercup because here we go here's the truth about sports we do this with life if somebody hurts us, or somebody gets promoted over us, or somebody gets some accolade that we don't get, we watch, and here's what we secretly think. Oh, I hope it doesn't work out for them. Oh, I hope they fail. Oh, I hope it falls apart for them. And when it does, we go, hee <laughs> hee, see? 
I knew. What are we saying? It's about me. And here's the amazing thing about this story. Everything, everything that Harold is doing, <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. Everything that Herod is doing in this story is actually pushing Jesus, pushing Mary and Joseph, even the wise men, where they need to be. Listen to what James 3 says. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom doesn't come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, listen to this one, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Why? Because we tend to think we're better than people, so we don't listen to other people. We don't want to do what they say. I'm not listening to anybody else. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And the enemy uses that for our pride to keep us from doing what's right. Because we look at somebody else and we go, well, they're worse than me. God's saying it's not about you. So here's what I want you to do, number two. Confess any selfish motives. Just be honest. You know what this verse says? It says, if you harbor bitter, it says, if you do that, just be honest about it. Just don't deny it. Don't pretend, oh, I never do anything wrong. And instead of looking for other people to fail, just look in the mirror and say, God, would you help me to do what's right? Number three, godly motives equal laying down our lives. Matthew 2, 9 to 12. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen where it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. By the way, this is prophesied by this guy in the Old Testament named Balaam. Balaam had a speaking donkey. He was the first Shrek. And he was actually going to... It's true. So he was actually going to go and prophesy against Israel. But once an angel showed up and said, I was going to kill you and leave your donkey, uh, uh, he kind of straightened out. So he went and prophesied for Israel. Well, when he did, one of the things he prophesied is that a star would rise that would reveal a king. So even that person who even the New Testament says was evil, God used. And it continues. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, it doesn't say stable, cave, just saying. On coming to the house... They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened, by the way, you notice Joseph's not in this one. Uh, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, time out. They did God's will, and things got worse for them. No TV preacher can preach on this passage. Because the truth is, sometimes when you do what God wants you to do, it gets harder. How do I know that? Because you would take Roman roads to get to where Jesus was. That was the highway. That was the flat way. That had drainage. And that had animals walk here and people walk here so you don't walk in the animal stuff. And there were all kind of soldiers every mile and all that. And on the way home, they had to go away where there were not Roman soldiers. And when they're not soldiers, it's kind of like getting rid of the police. So that's where the bandits hang out. And that's where the not good things. And the Bible says that they were warned in a dream and went another route. And it's not too much longer, just a few verses later, where Joseph is warned and they take off for Egypt. Well, here's something amazing. We know that Mary and Joseph were poor. You know how we know that? Because their first sacrifice is a dove, which could only be sacrificed by poor people. Other people would have to sacrifice a lamb. So we know they were poor. Well, how did they have money to go to Egypt, pay the taxes on the roads all the way? By the way, back then you think toll roads were bad in Orlando. You should have traveled through Rome. Matthew was one of those guys who would stop people and go, hmm, looks like you owe about, hmm, I don't know, $100. Here you go. 
And so Mary and Joseph, how did they have the means to be able to go to Egypt to protect Jesus? Oh, yeah, they had gold, they had frankincense, and they had myrrh. Do you think they were saving for Jesus' college fund? What did you think that was for? Somebody actually told me that yesterday. They said, I just thought Jesus was, they were saving for Jesus' college fund later, you know, whatever. The truth is, why did God bring these guys who then, Jesus would then fulfill prophecy by being in Egypt, another prophecy from the Old Testament? How could Jesus be in Bethlehem, in Egypt, be from Nazareth, all of these things? Because God knew exactly what he was doing. And you ready for this? God even used evil Herod, non-religious magi who probably worshipped who knows who, and God used them, even used Herod, knowing that Herod was trying to destroy Jesus. He had wrong motives. Listen, God's going to use people in your life who even try to hurt you to get you to where God wants you. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to think about that person that hurt you and go, that is just wonderful, Okay? You don't need to be church lady. But you need to recognize that God could even use that for your good. So now when you're able to look back at something that happened, when there was a wrong motive or a wrong intention, or you realize now somebody tried to manipulate you, when you look back, you can say, God, thank you that even through that you provided and you protected See, the Bible is very honest about what he was trying to do. And yet, the Bible is also very honest about how God guided the steps of Mary and Joseph and protected the baby Jesus. Why? Because the ultimate goal was the cross for us. John 15, Jesus says this, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. And so here's the final challenge for you. I want you to look for ways to lay down your life for other people. And if you have trouble doing things for people and hoping they'll notice, then I want to encourage you to do some anonymous things for people this time of year. I want to encourage you to go out of your way to do some things that people won't know about. To visit the little bucket of the Salvation Army that nobody will know how much you gave. To go out of your way to do something for someone that you know has no way to repay you. I did a funeral last weekend for a guy who heard me tell a story. And the story was about how I had this horrible experience in a cabin in North Carolina. Which doesn't surprise you guys because you've heard a lot of my stories. And he came up and said, hey... I've got a cabin in North Carolina. I'd be glad for you to use it. And so for the last, you ready for this? Almost 30 years, he's let us go to his cabin anytime we wanted, as long as we wanted, and never charged us a dime. So my children have grown up and can tell you right where Round Mountain is, where the cabin is, and they have hundreds and hundreds of memories of going there together as a family. Why? Because somebody took something they had and said, let me see how I can bless somebody with that. Somebody who can do nothing for me. So I want to encourage you. Maybe you don't have a cabin. But maybe you can make soup. And maybe you can write encouraging notes. Or maybe you can go out of your way to give somebody a Walmart gift card. Just to give whatever you give and just say, God, would you bless what I lay down to be a blessing to them? And God will use that. And by the way, you may be just like the wise men the gift that you bring may be exactly what that person needs. Just like Mary and Joseph needed those gifts to be able to travel, God knows what the people in your life need, and you may be the one to bring it to them. So do what God's called you to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him, to be a disciple of Jesus, to say, Jesus, I know you died and rose again to pay for my sins. I surrender my life to you. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's why Jesus came. We're going to pray and then we're going to have our time of offering with actual baskets. You don't have to give. And definitely don't give grumpy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer to close our service. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for each one here. I pray that you'd bless them. I thank you for the gift of your son. Lord, I thank you that even in the Christmas story, we see struggle, we see trial, but Lord, we also see how you provide. Lord, 
check our motives. Help us to do what's right. Lord, I pray our motives would be more like the wise men than like Herod. Lord, I pray that we could continually do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great